Hello and welcome to week 6's lectures. Uh, in today's uh, session, we'll be looking at chapters 9 to 12. In the previous session, we uh, begun chapter 9, where we were looking at the significance of uh, certain sculptures which had classical associations and we will continue with that in today's uh, lecture. We are at the entrance to Marquis Evermonde's uh, home in the countryside and uh, if you remember the previous session we saw that there were a lot of sculptures of Gauguin's head in the uh, boundary walls to uh, Marquis's home and the third person narrator gives us further information about the uh, specific objects which were displayed in the home of this aristocrat. It was a heavy mass of building, that chateau of Monsieur the Marquis with a large stone courtyard before it and two stone sweeps of staircase meeting in a stone terrace before the principal door, a stony business altogether with heavy stone balustrades and stone urns and stone flowers and stone faces of men and stone heads of lions in all directions as if the Gorgon's head had surveyed it when it was finished two centuries ago. So everything about the exterior to the home of the Marquis was made of stone. Look at the number of times the word stone is repeated. Uh, stone courtyard and then stone sweeps of staircase, stone terrace, uh, a stony business altogether. So uh, Dickens uh, spells out the metaphor uh, by this adjective stony. This is hard, cruel business the business of the aristocrat. So the metaphor is also spelt out there and then uh, let us get back to the counting of the reference to stones. We have one here, stone balustrades, stone urns, stone flowers, even the flowers uh, which are represented in the architecture is stony, it is made of stone and then the faces of uh, male sculptures again stone, stone heads of lions everywhere the sculptures are uh, built out of stone. Everywhere you looked you met with stones and uh, the narrator says that it is as if the gorgon, the classical gorgon uh, which had the capacity to turn those who looked at um, these creatures into stone. It is as if these gorgons have come and had a look at this exterior structures of the marquee and they have turned these uh, structures into stone. Stone. So, that is the uh, metaphorical and the literal signification of this particular architecture of this uh, uh, aristocrat who is um, known as Marquis Evermonde. The name will be clear uh, soon enough. So, what is the uh, figurative significance? Uh, as I mentioned before, it is a reference to the hard heartedness of the aristocrat here. The cruelty, the harshness, the ruthlessness is uh, signified in the reference to the stony nature of the home. The home is also a guideline to the minds and manners of the inhabitants. Now let us look at the way the hall is decorated, the hall of the home of Marquis Evermonde, the aristocrat in question. The hall is grim with certain old boar spears, swords and knives of the chase grimmer with certain heavy riding rods and riding whips of which many a person gone to his benefactor death had felt the weight when his lord was angry. So, the hall is decorated with implements that were used for punishment. So, look at the whips, the whips which wept. Uh, many a peasant which hurt many a peasant and these peasants also went to their benefactors who are, who are referred uh, to as, as death. So, it is death is a welcome space, death becomes a haven to rest. So, death figuratively becomes a, a person who does good things, who is very generous, who is like a benefactor, who is like a guardian here. So, and there are also other objects such as uh, spears, swords, knives, all these are weapons which inflict a lot of injury and harm 
to the receiver and um, this place has an aura of grimness it's not a welcome space, totally not a welcome space. space. It's quite the contrary, it's very harsh, it's very cruel. So you can see that the atmosphere, the ambience, the home, the domestic space of the aristocrats uh, bears all these markers of cruelty. So all these are markers, all these objects. Let's see who is uh, visiting this particular home of the Marquis and we will be surprised um, the first time readers of the novel will be uh, uh, even shocked to see that Charles Darnay is the nephew to the Marquis Evermonde, the man who is um, you know very very cruel and harsh, the man who recently killed a child by uh, running his carriage over that uh, uh, little uh, um, life and uh, we are surprised to see the relationship between Darnay and this Marquis Evermonde and uh, Charles Darnay is not very happy with his uncle and he says that um, you are also the reason uh, behind my arrest and uh, trial at uh, um, London and he says that you have given uh, um, you know rise to certain circ uh, suspicious circumstances about me which led to my arrest and he says you may have expressly worked uh, to give a more suspicious appearance to the suspicious circumstances that surround me so he points a finger of blame at his uncle the Marquis and the, we are also given the impression that the uncle is not favorably inclined towards his own uh, nephew and we wonder why which again points to a mystery in the past of these relatives and we would know why exactly there is a lot of um, ill feeling and resentment between the two of them. So um, we also are given to understand that uh, the uncle is a shady character because he deliberately sets out to harm and even have his nephew killed by the British government by giving um, you know uh, rise to certain situations and circumstances which indicate that Charles Darnay could have been a spy and um, we are also uh, given to understand that perhaps Barsad and his uh, friend Cly were working with the Marquis in order to um, kind of collect a set of evidence against Charles Darnay. And Charles Darnay is aware that uh, his uncle is behind the trial scene in fact. Now we have a set of conversation between the Marquis and the nephew which tells us about two different uh, uh, approaches to life, two different philosophies, one held by Darnay and the other by his uncle the Marquis. Let's see what they are, the two philosophies. And this is uh, the uncle's um, words here, we have so asserted our station both in the old time and in the modern time also, um, said the nephew gloomily. So we have uh, Charles Darnay here, Charles Darnay is in fact uh, the speaker of this set of words who says that I believe that our name to be more detested than any name in France and to this uh, assertion of Charles Darnay we have the response of the Marquis who says that repression is the only lasting philosophy the dark deference of fear and slavery my friend will keep the dogs obedient to the whip as long as this roof shuts out the sky. So very interesting exchange and two extreme opinions are also shared here. Uh, the nephew says that we have been completely hated by everybody uh, and uh, he says that we have forced our uh, situation in life, we have become uh, oppressors of the people who are beneath us in a social station both in the olden days and in the modern time too. So we have been 
continually oppressing the people using our status in life as the uh, reason, as a privilege to oppress. And he says that we are completely detested, we're completely hated, we are more hated than any other noble line. This particular noble line of the Evramon days are uh, detested, loathed by the people than any, any other noble lineage in French uh, history. And to which um, comments, the Marquis says that repression is the time-tested philosophy. Lasting here refer, uh, refers to time-tested. It is uh, something that is proven over the course of time and therefore he implies that repression is the best philosophy. It's good to oppress people. In fact, it's good to have people fear um, the aristocrats fear us nobility. It's good to have people in slavery because only when we are fearful, only when we are scary, the dogs will be obedient to us, to our usage of the whip. And um, I want to go back to the previous uh, slide here where there are reference to whips here and whips which have been used on the peasants. So he says that it's good to uh, injure, hurt and uh, make people frightened of us, only then we will be obeyed. Um, and that's the philosophy of the Marquis. And he says that this is uh, going to be the truth, repression is going to be the truth by which we will lead our lives as long as this roof, the home, the country estate, the country estate which has a lot of stone structures, uh, as long as this structure uh, kind of uh, blocks out the sky, as long as this roof is standing between us and the sky, this philosophy is going to hold and that's what the Marquis believes in. But Charles Darnay uh, insists on offering a different um, take on uh, his uncle's philosophy. He says that um, I am bound to a system that's frightful to me, uh, responsible for it but powerless in it, seeking to execute the last request of my dear mother's lips and obey the last look of my dear mother's eyes which implored me to have mercy and to redress and tortured by seeking assistance and power in vain. So the system that Darne is talking about here is the aristocracy. And he says this, uh, he says that in this system, which is frightful to me, which is scary to me, uh, I also feel responsible. I have a certain set of obligations that I have to deliver, but I'm also made powerless in the system to do real good. And I also want to execute, carry out the wishes of my dear mother who has uh, um, asked me to uh, perform certain duties uh, when she died. And he is striving to carry out his obligations, uh, uh, advised by his uh, mother, and he is also not able to fully fulfill it for certain reasons and therefore he is also tortured. So we get a sense that Charles Darnay is very helpless. He is somehow caught in this system, he is trapped in the system of aristocracy and he wants to carry out certain duties at least which have been um, uh, endured on him by his mother as a kind of redressal to a certain set of people whom these people have wronged but he is not able to do it because he is not able to uh, kind of find out the location and the identity of these um, set of characters. So this is the mysterious context to some of the quandaries in which Darnay finds himself. And does Charles Darnay also further offers um, uh, references to the past in which the Marquis and his brother have committed injustices against the peasantry. And he says that even in my father's time we did a world of wrong injuring every human creature who came between us and our pleasure, whatever it was. Why need I speak of my father's time when it is equally yours? Can I separate my father's twin brother, joint inheritor and next successor from himself? 
So Charles Darnay is uh, pointing out to the grievous injuries that the Marquis' um, uh, uh, brother and Marquis did in the past and in the present too. And we also come to know that the father is no longer alive, the father is dead, the father of Darnay is dead. And he says that in the past, we did a world of wrong. Our noble uh, lineage did a world of wrong. Uh, we have injured people who came between us and our pleasure. We were completely exploiting everybody who came uh, under our sight. And he says that my father's time is also your, your time because you were um, twins. My father and you were twins. So you have jointly shared all the injustice uh, that you committed against the peasantry and he says I cannot separate my father's twin brother um, that is I cannot separate you and my father because you are also the inheritor and the next heir to my father. So we kind of get a sense of the family connections of Charles Darnay. So we have the twin brothers the two uh, Evermonde brothers Evermonde the elder And the younger, the younger is the one who is uh, alive right now. The elder has passed away. The younger one is uh, the current marquis, the heir to the par property. And he's the one who killed the child by uh, riding over uh, the kid with his uh, horse carriage. So um, the other symbolic thing that we need to remember is that the idea of twinness, duality, doubleness, runs through the entire narrative. So here we have the Marquis brothers, two Marquis brothers mirroring each other uh, and that uh, idea of duality is also carried on in this particular novel and we have other twin uh, aspects such as London and Paris uh, being twin cities and then we have um, Lucy Manette and Madame Defarge as uh, twin female characters with uh, widely contrasting desires uh, from their lives and so on and so forth. So um, and then this also connects, uh, connects us to the idea of extremes of philosophies. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have the revolution. On the other hand, we have the aristocracy oppressing the people. There doesn't seem to be a moderate path, um, so to speak, so far now. But there are hints of that uh, as you read the novel when we realize that uh, the family of the Manettes become uh, a kind of a shining embodiment of this middle path, the moderate quality. So Charles Darnay uh, claims that he is going to renounce his aristocratic uh, lineage, his connections with the French uh, nobility and he says that I do not want to do any, anything further with this uh, set of connections uh, and he says that I do not want to also lay claim to the property because there is a curse on it and on all this land which is owned by the, um, uh, by the upper class, the French aristocrats and he says that if it ever becomes mine, it shall be put into some hands better qualified to free it slowly from the weight that drags it down. And he says that if there comes a point of time when I am the heir, when I am the owner of this particular property, I will pass it on to better hands, hands which will be capable of offering redressal uh, to the people who are associated with this particular property in France. And, um, and those people will be able to kind of uh, remove the weight that burdens the uh, history of this particular uh, lineage and the country estate. It's a very uh, poignant moment in the story because we see that Darnay really genuinely wants to offer some kind of reparation Reparation is compensation for generations who have been uh, grievously injured by the behavior of the uh, aristocracy and he is not able to um, do anything about it and therefore he says I will give it away to someone who is capable of doing all those redressal and um, this passage should remind you of uh, uh, certain lines in Austin's Persuasion when we see Anne Elliot um, uh, 
commenting that Kellynch Hall has passed on to uh, better hands, hands which will be uh, capable of running the estate in a better manner than the elites themselves did. So we can see that kind of thematic connection between persuasion and a tale of two cities in terms of the uh, role and place and function of the country estate. Now let's uh, look at the differing attitudes uh, of the Marquis and his nephew about uh, England. Uh, nephew thinks of England as a refuge, uh, a, a heaven in fact, whereas the Marquis thinks that his nephew has shirked his responsibilities and run away uh, to this country to be rid of all his responsibilities. Uh, whereas the Marquis says that um, I am um, now happy there because I earn my bread uh, by my own labor and he says that yes I have also started um, you know uh, making uh, uh, friendships and social connections with a doctor with a daughter uh, with a daughter and uh, uh, the Marquis very uh, slyly and ironically um, says that yes it's it's a doctor with a daughter and yes so commences the new philosophy and he says that um, the Marquis he implies that the nephew is simply uh, trying to have a romantic fling uh, uh, romantic associations with this particular daughter of a doctor and we are also um, led to believe that perhaps uh, the Marquis knows about the history of the doctor here and therefore um, he is uh, not very happy with his nephew. So uh, for Darnay, England is a, a, a place which gives him a lot of protection, protection from the clutches of the burden of the aristocracy and um, the Marquis is very clever because he knows that Darnay is in a relationship, uh, at least has sociable uh, connections with a doctor and a daughter and he knows that perhaps Darnay is romantically connected with the daughter and he misinterprets that connection uh, and um, suggests that perhaps the philosophy is this romance um, is this romance that's budding between the two and that particular philosophy is making Darnay shirk off his uh, philosophy of repression and oppression which underlines uh, and underlies the aristocratic principles in uh, the French um, uh, countryside. Now uh, Darnay goes to bed and um, the Marquis uh, just before he retires for the night is moving about in his uh, bedroom and the third person narrator very sharply uh, kind of summarizes um, the uh, metaphoric elements that can be elicited in the uh, body language in the demeanor of the Marquis. Rustling about the room, his softly slippered feet making no noise on the floor, he moved like a refined tiger, looked like some enchanted marquee of the impenitently wicked sort, in story whose periodical change into tiger form was either just going off or just coming on. It's a very, very uh, metaphoric uh, section uh, in terms of the characterization of Marquis Evermonde. The third person narrator says that this man is very softly moving about on the carpeted floor of the bedroom and um, that kind of soft movement can be compared to uh, a very sophisticated creature like the tiger. Like a tiger which is about to spring onto its prey, onto its victim and um, that is one uh, figurative association. The other association comes from the world of magic. For example, um, an ogre can change forms and um, it can change uh, from say uh, a cat to a tiger and from a tiger back into a cat uh, uh, depending on its desire. 
in, in that kind of transformation, um, this particular market is like uh, some ogre which is uh, already become a tiger is about or is about to become a tiger. So it's, it's a magical moment that retains its cruelty, its harshness, its beastly character. That's what is um, emphasized in this particular um, description of the marquee by the third person. So it's almost very tigerish. Uh, that's what is implied here. And this tigerish attribute is something that uh, Madame Defarge also possesses. And by connecting these two characters, the marquee and the uh, female antagonist, by commenting that they all look like beastly characters, uh, Dickens is somehow saying that there is a parallel between these two systems, the oppressed and the oppressive. So the aristocrat uh, and the injured peasant uh, come to resemble one another in their desire for oppression on the one hand and um, in the desire for vengeance on the other. In both both these desires, they are beastly, they are tigerish. So it's a uh, very enchanting paragraph as well in the sense that, um, you know, the Marquis is constantly in this beastly character of the element of the tigerish. Now the Marquis goes to bed and he does not get up in the morning. Why he is killed in his bed. He is stabbed to death by someone who wanted to wreak vengeance on uh, the Marquis. So um, this chapter ends with this comment uh, that drive him fast to his storm, this from Jacques. This comment is actually written in a piece of paper, a brief letter. And that letter is stuck to the knife that stabs the Marquis to death. So who is this man who murdered the Marquis? And the answer is uh, kind of uh, clear. It could um, not be any other than Gaspard, the father who lost his young child to the reckless driving of the Marquis, the man who uh, hid on the underside of the carriage of the Marquis and uh, who traveled slyly, uh, who traveled secretively and who waited for his time when the Marquis was on his own and stabbed him to death. So what is very interesting is that though the tiger is the one that hunts its victims, though the Marquis is tigerish, um, it is uh, interesting to note that it is uh, the tiger who got hunted here by the peasant whom the tiger injured. Now let's come to chapter 10 uh, where we see a domestic picture in uh, London at the home of uh, Soho Squire uh, and uh, in, it is in this home the majority of the scene is set. And we get to know also more about Charles Darnay, the tutor, the professional. So what is his context in terms of his profession, in terms of, its, uh, of his romantic um, aspirations uh, with regard to Lucy. So Darnay is the professional and he is a tutor whose attainments made the student's way unusually pleasant and profitable and as an elegant translator who brought something to his work beside mere dictionary knowledge, young Darnay soon became known and encouraged. So Darnay is extremely successful as a professional um, tutor because he is not offering mere book learning, he is also um, kind of offering offering original uh, guidance and original work, therefore he becomes popular. And uh, the third person narrator says that he had expected labor and he found it and he did it and made the best of it. In this his prosperity consisted. So uh, in Britain he expected hard work. So we see the middle class work ethic at play here too. So uh, in Britain, um, 
Charles Darnay doesn't uh, live like an aristocrat. In fact, he uh, works for his living and in that work he is prosperous. And what is very interesting is that um, the narrator also suggests that his work is not mechanical, not mechanical labor. There is a, a kind of an um, original contribution to knowledge uh, with reference to the translation uh, work that Darnay uh, engages in and that becomes uh, interesting uh, in the context of Darnay because that suggests that he is being a professional and not a worker and uh, Darnay prospers in Britain. Now, in this chapter, we do get the sense that the romantic plot is beginning to unravel. Uh, so far, we did see the historical plot, we did see the political plot, and now for the first time we have the domestic plot uh, germinating in relation to Charles Darnay and Lucy Minette and this is the comment that the third person narrator has to say about the function of Darnay and he kind of turns this into a philosophy which affects all young men from the time of uh, Eden. He says that now from the days when it was always summer in Eden to these days when it is mostly winter in fallen latitudes, the world of a man has invariably gone one way, Charles Darnay's way, the way of the love of woman. So from the time of the Garden of Eden when human, um, uh, human beings were unfallen, were pristine, to the days when the human uh, uh, species had fallen, the theme is the uh, same, the theme is the love of women on the part of man. So that is the uh, point that the third person narrator is uh, hinting at and he also seems to say that uh, romance is inevitable. So we have a lot of courtship plots developing here um, with Lucy Manette at the center. We have Charles Darnay who is interested in Lucy Manette and we have Mr. Striver, the advocate who is also interested in uh, marrying Lucy Manette and of course there is also Sidney Carton whom we have uh, sensed is also affected by uh, Lucy Manette in a romantic manner. So this is evidenced during the trial scene and we also see that there is some kind of relationship between Lucy and um, Charles Darnay during the trial scene too. Now uh, we have Charles Darnay speaking to Dr. Manette about his desires in terms of um, a romantic union between Lucy and himself. He says that in uh, I know that in loving you she sees and loves her mother at her own age, sees and loves you at my age, loves her mother broken hearted, loves you through your dreadful trial and in your blessed restoration. I have known this night and day since I have known you in your home. So Charles Darnay is um, kind of uh, saying to Dr. Manette that I am aware that uh, she is very much a, a close relation of yours because um, she has suffered quite a bit in her past and due to the heartbreak of her mother, due to the death of her mother and because of the dreadful trial that you underwent for 18 long years. So because of all this you share a special relationship and I do not want to come in between. I do not want to break the bond. I have come to strengthen your bond and he says that there is a hallowed light about your relation. There is a sacredness to your relationship which I do not want to disturb or stain and he says that I am going to strengthen it by wanting to bind myself with Lucy Manette. And he spells it out very clearly to Dr. Manette who, and he says that I look only to sharing your fortunes, sharing your life. 
and home and being faithful to you to the death not to divide with Lucy her privilege as your child companion and friend but to come in aid of it and bind her closer to you if such a thing can be done um, so the point here is that he wants to strengthen the relationship between the father and the daughter by uh, marrying her and not to divide it at all thank you for uh, listening I'll continue in the next session